Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar on Nine Elms Park. I'm Peter Murray, Curator in Chief at New London Architecture, or NLA. Uh, we're a think tank focusing on London's built environment. And also, I started the London Festival of Architecture 16 years ago now. So I'm very pleased to be moderating this event today as part of the festival's month long London wide celebration of architecture in the capital. Today, uh, we're at Vineb, Vauxhall, Nine Elms and Battersea, one of the largest of the mayor's 40 odd opportunity areas for development right across London. And I, I can well remember in November 2009, the late Sir Simon Milton, then Deputy Mayor for Planning at the uh, GLA, launching the consultation document for the Opportunity Area Planning Framework one evening at the NLA. And that framework set out the draft layout and the volumetric shaping for the area. And the, the GLA had led the production of uh, the document uh, in its role as the Strategic Planning Authority for London, working closely with uh, Lambeth and Wandsworth. And after lots of consultation, the plan was adopted in 2012. And the key feature of the arrangement of the plan, uh, which had to coordinate a, a number of different uh, private developers, uh, was a new park, part of a green link that would connect Battersea Park in the west, right along the River Thames to Lambeth Palace Gardens in the east. And the park became an even more important feature uh, following the consultation. In 2009, it, it was just 1.7 hectares in size. By 2012, it had grown to four and a half hectares. Now, one of the aims of the public space program uh, in the area was to activate uh, the railway arches as well, um, including opening up, opening up key arches to enable new pedestrian connections. And the London Festival of Architecture organized uh, the Arch 42 competition, uh, which came up with some super ideas uh, for creating uh, designs for, for those links. So an, another area where the festival has been engaged with uh, uh, VNEB. So on the park, uh, Wandsworth has worked uh, closely with local developers, landowners, designers, and uh, Professor Matthew Carmona at uh, uh, University College London to develop a cohesive design and also London's first innovative uh, pop or privately owned public space Charter. And this is an area where there's been lots of debate in recent years. Uh, sometimes they're called poppers or uh, privately owned publicly accessible space. And it's all about just how public or private they actually are. Now, the panel today will discuss the creation of open space as an integral part of the uh, development here and how Wandsworth is working with partners to open up new public areas of Nine Elms for the first time. And we're going to look at what it takes to achieve an open space project of this huge scale and how publicly accessible open spaces are embedded in the Nine Elms master plan and are part of the neighborhood's vision about caring for uh, residents, visitors, future generations, and most importantly, in the post COVID environment, uh, creating healthier cities. And uh, before we uh, start the main event, I would just remind the audience that uh, they can submit questions in writing to the panel via the Q&A function on your screen. So uh, please do that and we'll pick them up at the end. But uh, to uh, start off proceedings, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Councillor Ravi Govindia, who is leader of Wandsworth Council. And Ravi has led the council since 2012, focusing on Regeneration, Housing, Planning and Finance, and he's, he's co-chair of the Nine Elms Vauxhall Partnership, and he played a, a key role in securing the Northern Line extension to Nine Elms, and he's joined this morning by Jennifer Jackson, Assistant Director of Environment and Community Services at uh, Wandsworth Council. So, Ravi, please do uh, start the proceedings. Well, thank you very much, Peter, and um, you mentioned that uh, Vineb was one of Mayor's 40 opportunity areas. May I say it is perhaps the most successful opportunity area 
uh, in the mayor's portfolio, one that uh, you and I were at the launch to that in 2009, and in, in just over a decade, it has actually taken shape and it is, it is a living, breathing new uh, uh, district for London. You'll also remember that this is an area which was largely an industrial, post-industrial landscape where there was little or no need for open spaces or an urban park. And it was important as part of our vision for the delivery of the opportunity area that there was such a link, such a park in the middle of it, linking, as you, as you mentioned, established uh, parks at Battersea and at the Archbishop's Palace in Lambeth, but also many, many other local parks on the periphery of the opportunity area. The new park runs like a spine through the area with ribs connecting with existing and new spaces. And some of the new spaces along the river are just as important because they make the river now much more accessible than it was when it was all chained off and, uh, and, and covered by industrial land use. The Batsy Power Station will deliver a six acre park right in front of the power station and with a jetty in the river, creating a very, very exciting new public realm for that development. But what I would just want to remind viewers is that at the heart of the uh, public realm strategy and embedded in the, in, the, in the opportunity area document is this kind of statement which says to create a new strategic green link from Lambeth Palace to Battersea Park, including a linear park from Vauxhall through Nine Elms to Battersea Power Station. And missing out the Battersea Park itself, which is a huge, huge urban lung for ones with, and will be an, an enormous uh, amenity for the area. The great other uh, part of the public realm strategy was to endeavor uh, every development to deliver a good public realm for their development. And they all should be linked up with the new linear park that was at the heart of the new, new, new uh, opportunity area. And the linear park, now just the park, just now the Nine Elms Park, because it is living, breathing and acting. It will be, and I think people have seen it already, it is full of different types so planting different textures, different landscapes, giving different feel to this new urban park. And there, are, there will be around the, the new river, uh, the Royal Mail development, in fact, a great big area of green space with performance locations, as well as sort of kickabout places. It's a vision that is shape, taking shape, and I'm very proud to have led parts of it. And Mr. Jackson will take us through some of the details on how we have achieved our vision and continue to make sure that the vision, uh, that what is delivered is remains true to that vision. Thank you, Councillor Govindia. Next slide, please. So as Councillor Govindia set out, the park runs east to west through the opportunity area and is shown shaded green on this slide. The park is a key ingredient of the 227 hectare opportunity area with a planning framework which envisages a new neighbourhood with around 20,000 new homes and up to 25,000 jobs delivered through the development overall. As a strategic link and strategic open space, the park creates a new place which provides opportunities for active travel, for new infrastructure, sustainable drainage, biodiversity, ecology and also health and well-being benefits. Next slide, please. The park is an exemplar of placemaking at its best. The only land that Wandsworth Council controls within the park boundary is at Ponton Road. The park therefore presented an opportunity to add value through the planning process. This slide shows the number of owners which were involved in the Wandsworth section of the park. And as Wandsworth Council has handled each planning application, it has ensured that through legal agreements with each planning permission, each section of the park is secured for the future as a single coherent space. It's a strategic project with significant investment from those developer, developers identified on the slide who have worked proactively together. And you will hear more about this shortly from Emily de Enrico in terms of ongoing management and maintenance of the privately owned public space. The objective for the council being that it feels like a public space delivered as a single entity. Next slide, please. The park offers primary, secondary and tertiary connections in terms of travel. Pedestrian routes are shown on this slide. The primary network acts as an east-west spine with walking routes leading off it. There are green fingers that run up to the river to the north and down to the south towards the railway arches. 
the park effectively creates a series of outdoor rooms that you can choose to either walk through on the tertiary routes or move through more quickly along the spine. And Paul Shirley Smith will detail this more when he speaks. Next slide, please. It's a park for residents, for workers, visitors and a new destination. It does a number of things as set out on this slide. It delivers a four and a half hectare park with significant tree planting. Play spaces will be created throughout with one already delivered at Embassy Gardens. And as Councillor Govindia said, there will be performance areas and event spaces which underpin the approved cultural strategy for the area. It provides for utilities beneath it, for sustainable drainage, planting that meets biodiversity objectives, and a link for walking and cycling with infrastructure to support this. It's a unique selling point and a park for everyone. Thank you for listening and back to you, Peter. Thank you very much. And uh, now our next speaker is uh, Paul Shirley Smith. He's a director at Camden's who are uh, landscape architects and he's been playing an advisory role <laughs> in the landscape design of the whole park to uh, create this sort of uh, identity right across all the various ownerships. So Paul, over to you. Thank you, well, I'm going to share screen now. Um, yeah. um, so hopefully that's sharing okay. So um, as Peter said, I'm a, I'm a landscape architect, so I'm going to talk about this uh, from a designer's point of view. Um, and as we've heard from Jennifer, um, the, what's, what's really important here is that the park is, is a unified whole. This is a piece of substantial green infrastructure, um, but really important to understand it's created by different people at, at different times and implemented at different times. So we've, we've worked um, really hard with huge teams of people over, over you know, 10 years, and particularly with, with the borough of Wandsworth, but many others, to make sure it, it works as a single entity, even though there are, there are so many different teams producing it. Um, so what needs to come across to the public is there's a continuous journey from end to end. So that's coordinated in terms of the design for movement, for pedestrians, for cycles, in terms of materiality, um, the different types of granite and the different kinds of softer materials um, to make sure it's accessible to everybody. Um, and the planting style, needs to have variety, but also needs to have continuity. And in terms of the, the scale of the trees, the size of the trees, the species, and there's over 1600 trees altogether. And then there's a mixed mosaic style of planting based on native species to promote biodiversity, as Jennifer has said, the furnishings are coordinated. Really important also the lighting is coordinated. This is a 24 seven public park accessible to everybody. It needs to feel safe and accessible. Um, and also the distribution of facilities, as, as we'll see across the whole, the whole park, is logical. It makes sense. It's really worked out. So, um, with it, but also important to understand within this really strong framework, um, there are distinct character areas, different places. So, as you move on this journey from end to end, you actually pass through lots of different places. So, each has a different feel, varying in, in terms of the scale of landscape, the balance, soft and hard, different types of activity. Um, the facilities in the park, active frontages, community uses, resi entrances, all these things combine um, to, 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 to make sort of continuously changing interest over the whole um, one kilometre journey. Um, so I'll just, I'll just, so I'll just um, start working through now, working through these different, these different spaces. So um, at the, the arrival plaza is on Wandsworth Road at the RNF development. So this is a really uh, busy space. It's the eastern entrance to the park and there's active frontage and spin out space, but actually also there's a real, real um, focus on, on play facilities and playable landscape. Um, it needs to be very visually prominent and it'll, it'll draw people into the park from the Vauxhall end. And then when we get to the Great Lawn, um, the space really opens up and there's a large grassed area, which is good for informal events. Um, and, um, more and more, more formal events, but um, it's a sloping lawn. It's it's sort of sculpted with these south-facing terraces. Um, so, and this this starts to show show some of that. So this image actually shows what was alluded to earlier: the how the um, riverside, the green riverside walk, and the um, the linear park are really great alternatives to the um, you know the previously only existing movement corridor was Nine Elms Lane. So you know that's going to feel so different now. Um, and the right-hand image shows the um, shows the scale of the space and the importance of, of busy 
active frontages, active edges. And then we move to the MC Gardens part of the park. So this is you know slightly more hard, there's a bit more variety, and we can see what this is like. That's one of the lovely things about this. Now we can actually see that you know much of this has now appeared. Um, yeah, but it's although it's has hard areas, it's actually still very green and it's still very play focused, even though it's very smart. So we have play area, we have the introduction of water, which is which is really lovely, a whole other, other dimension to it. Um, and the tree species, again, as I say, they're coming coming through from end to end of the park, bringing it all together visually. Um, so um, these images show, so on the left, we can see the intense greening and the informal landscape within within one of the blocks as a, a public um, route coming through there. And then we have this kind of very smart landscape with, with water in front of the embassy. And this shows artwork being introduced. And, and this view looking back down towards Vauxhall shows the, the scale really of the park and how it, how it connects the city up. Um, these, there's more views here. I think what comes across to me from these views is the greening. They're already green. These are photographs of the, of the existing landscape. And this is nothing compared to what it'll be like when the trees mature. You know, this is when they're just planted. So then we come to the part which we've been closely involved in the design of. This is the, the bit um, owned by Royal Mail from Ponton Road um, westward. So um, Ponton Road is actually the only place where there's a north-south vehicle route, a full-on public road, if you like, through the park. But rather than um, cut the park in two, it needs to the, 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 the road needs to flow over. So um, yeah, this is looking at that in a bit more detail. So um, it's really important that the character of the park dominates over the character of the road. And then around plot G, we've got this intensely green um, intensely green series of spaces. So at the south here, we've got a communal communal square, which is, we've actually got communal uses in this development and this development facing, making a communal square between the two. This is a very busy kind of spill out space with cafes on, on both sides, terraced, terraced landscape. Um, this shows the character of, of Ponton Road, where um, you know, there's trees planted in the middle of the road. It's a raised, a raised table, different materiality. So that's really going to slow vehicles down and, and um, appreciate how the park will, will, will flow across the space. Um, and these images start to show some of the, some of the ways that, um, that, that we as designers um, can start to redress the balance between pedestrian movement, the cycle movement and, and vehicle movement. So making spaces which are, which are great, but family friendly and much safer. Um, and then these images start to show how you can have spaces which are uh, very green, but also very intensely used, which is which the space will, will be. Um, and this shows the space by Block G with, with cafes on both sides. But the what we're very intent on is the you know the terracing and the layout and all of the detail, make sure it's a really exciting, intriguing space, you know, e even if the cafes aren't open, it's a really good family friendly environment that will engage people, it's fun, it's green, um, and it works, works for everybody. So then we come to uh, Mill Pond Lawn, um, which is the sort of a central area just south of um, uh, phase one of, of Ballymore. So we've got uh, big pedestrian thoroughfares along the north and south side, um, but then we've got this undulating kind of landscape route, if you like, through the park, so that all of these features are really sort of accessible to everybody and really engaging. So we've got a, a very playable landscape here with these undulating um, sort of landscape forms, and then actually a full-on play equipment here. Um, very active frontage along the south side of Ballymore there with, um, with a little, lots of planting as well. So uh, these views show some of some of that character. They show the scale of it, um, show active frontage and, and how the landscape is sculpted and how the path sort of takes you through and joins all these things together. Uh, and this is another view um, of that from a higher angle, again, just showing the, the sort of sheer variety of experience and, and, and the visual interest, but also all the different options for, for movement and, and play. Uh, and this actually shows the play equipment, which is all bespoke, developed for the park, um, which will be part of, part of um, the, the contracts which are now coming together. Um, and it's, you know, one important aspect of this is the, is the scale of it, but also and the fact that it's very inclusive. It's using going to all the the best standards that we can find to make it inclusive for everybody. Uh, and then we come to Mill Pond Wood, um, which is actually a piece of very substantial um, 
suds infrastructure, drainage infrastructure, it's actually a sunken area, which is very intensely green, very intensely planted, but, but so people don't just have to move around it. We've made sure it's very engaging by putting a whole series of, of boardwalks over it, of some timber boardwalks, which connect in all directions. So that's mo for movement, but also for just for the refuge really, and for people to, to enjoy. Um, so this is, this is an image showing this kind of sinuous route through um, and how people can sit in it and enjoy it. And, you know, they're really kind of evolved with all the greenery and the trees are actually growing up through the, growing up through the boardwalk. Um, and this, again, this shows the levels and how some of that works and how, how um, it, it really does engage people and provide so many different sorts of opportunities for people to enjoy. Uh, and then we come down towards the, the, the largest piece of grass actually in the whole Piece, the um, the park basin, um, whereas the the park at, at the RNF end, sorry, the um, the lawn at the RNF end is is kind of sculpted and sloping. This is is coordinating as much in as much as it's a different type of experience. It's a big flat lawn with actually terrace sides around it, so it's actually more suitable as a as a kickabout area or even a formal um, you know formal events. Um, and it's actually got a deck um, in front of it with a with a staging, um, all the sides of terrace so people can sit around it, and it has very active frontage um, and this shows some of the uses some of the kind of um uh, some of the type of atmosphere you know that we expect there so we've got these raised terraces at the edges so people can sit all around on days when the grass isn't dry which it isn't always um, and then on the western side then we've got this very substantial um hardwood sculpture the scu sculptural seat i'm sure we'll think of a better name at some point but um it's a, it's a very substantial piece it sits in front of the cultural use um, on, the, on the ground floor and opens out directly onto it but, but also it's intended to be particularly engaging for children which I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Um, this is a view from above the basin looking down back towards Foxhill again and I, I guess this view shows um, you know these really well pronounced clear routes through the park and um, one of the various entrances opening onto it combined with this um, you know, this really intense greening as well. Um, you know, those things work together. This, this is Mill Pond Wood, and you know, this is the park basin. Um, and again, this, this shows from the park basin from lower down now, so we can see the, 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 the scale of the space, all the different active frontages, um, and all, all the different activities um, you'd have on there. This is actually quite a sunny, sunny place here with um, substantial trees around, around the edges. Uh, and then this this last image actually is the school um, on the southwest corner, which opens out directly onto the park. This is the front door, front door, you know, front entrance of the uh, of the school, which has a lot of other community facilities in as well. So, you know, what a, what a great place to have a school. Um, and then this is the the cultural use here on the ground floor with the with the sculptural seat um, in front of it. So there's always imagined um, school children pouring out and climbing all over the climbing all over the seats and their parents sitting and waiting for them and so on. So um yeah that's that's the end of this uh, part of the journey. But um I hope that gives you um a idea really of the of the of the, the huge range of um huge, huge range of experiences in the park and, and how it's um um sort of quite in, intensely designed for for an awful lot of different activity and how it's you know inclusive and um above all it's really engaging for people. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and now our next speaker is Professor Matthew Carmona, and he's Professor of Planning and Urban Design at the Bartlett School of Planning at University College London. And he's been central to the debate in recent years around improving public space. He chairs the Place Alliance and also was, was closely involved in developing the POPs Charter uh, for Nine Elms Park. So, Matthew, over to you. Thank you very much, Peter. So we've heard uh, about Nine Elms, Nine Elms Park, and uh, of course, uh, in recent years, we've also heard uh, lots of voices uh, uh, talking about um, the so-called privatisation of public space, uh, voices led by, by The Guardian, uh, many of whom argue that it's exactly the sort of spaces that we've heard about that, uh, that it, you know, they argue perhaps shouldn't be allowed because they're owned and managed by private interests. 
um, the Guardian goes so far as to say that we should be angry about uh, these sorts of spaces uh, being created. But of course, in a city like London, these spaces, in a sense, are nothing new. London is a collage of, of, of space, uh, much owned by the and managed by the public sector, but also much owned by uh, the private sector or other uh, institutions such as universities this is a sign on the side of one of our Bartlett buildings which which effectively says that half the street belongs to the university and people don't generally notice the sign and don't really realize the distinction and that's the way that, that, that cities are of course constructed. So in fact when we think about privatization of public space you know here is a classic example at King's Cross what we're actually really talking about is the publicization of private space, because these are not spaces that were owned and, and managed by, by the public sector and have somehow made their way into private hands. They're actually spaces which are uh, owned by the private sector and are being brought into public use. So there's potential there for a huge gain uh, for the public uh, at large. And on that basis, I sort of argued over the years that morally and pragmatically, it doesn't really matter who finally owns and manages these spaces. What really matters is what our rights are as, as citizens within space and, and what are the responsibilities to us of those who own and manage them. And of course, what we find is that whether spaces are owned and managed by the private or public sectors, often there are sort of needless and petty restrictions that can be, uh, you know, that restrict exactly what we can do. This is me being told off in a, in a private space for taking a, a, a photograph. Actually, this is a space, a privately owned and managed space right outside the Tower, Hamlet, Tower Hamlets uh, uh, um, City Hall. But equally many of our public spaces have very long se sequences of bylaws and controls and so forth. Uh, these are the controls that govern all the spaces in, in the, uh, owned and managed by the city of Westminster. You can't do all sorts of things, um, some of which quite concerning, like you can't make a, you can't, you can't give out literature or, or, or make speeches. Uh, or if you happen to be in a verminous or offensively dirty condition, you can't sit on a seat. Because of this, I've argued for many years that we should be thinking about a, a charter of public space rights and responsibilities that, that, that lay down what are our rights as citizens uh, within spaces in our city and put up a straw man, a sort of wor a potential wording for such a charter some years ago. And, and in fact, uh, the mayor of London picked up on this and, 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 and has, has argued the case for a charter in the London plan and has produced his own draft charter. And more importantly, in the context of what we're talking about today, uh, Wandsworth, the London Borough of Wandsworth, picked up on this idea of a charter and Sharon Malloy and Mark Hunter in particular um, thought that this might be a good idea for the linear park. So they asked me um, to uh, work with the landowners and themselves to think about whether we could uh, develop a charter for the park. And we started off by having a meeting all of the, uh, the, the, the different parties together in one room. And we started off by, uh, and some other parties who sort of joined the discussion later, and we started off by discussing the straw man wording. And this is it, it's a very simple set of wording uh, or words around what might be the sort of roles and responsibilities within space. Um, more important than the wording was the ideas that, uh, that are sort of embedded within it. That, you know, with rights come responsibilities, both for those people using park spaces or other spaces, but also those who manage those spaces. That principles should, should apply regardless of ownership. Um, it's about safeguarding freedoms, not restricting behaviours, and that seems to be very, very important. People don't like their behaviours being restricted needlessly for petty reasons. We should keep it simple, only control or don't control more than necessary and keep it clear. And I, and I think those broad principles were very much accepted by all of who were around the table at that time. And so as we talked about those sort of principles in the sort of straw man charter, we thought about how they might relate to the Nine Elms Park and we developed uh, uh, our own wording. Uh, and this is it, you won't be able to read it. It's, the text is far too small on the screen, um, but underpinning this was a remarkable consensus amongst all around the table that we needed such a document to set down what were these rights and responsibilities, a feeling that such a, a charter could protect the public, could protect the citizens of Wandsworth and elsewhere when they visit uh, the park, 
um, but also protects the private interest because none of these uh, none of the developers owns the whole park they all own bits of it and so in a sense they need to be you know they, they want the the park to work as a as, as a whole um, so the wording itself uh, was uh, deliberately written in very positive language, encouraging rather than discouraging behaviours. Um, everybody is welcome to use the park. There's very little actually prohibited uh, in, in the wording. Just a couple of things like lighting fires and, 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 and driving through the park. Um, and clear responsibilities for all uh, parties. And, and, and that means users of the park, everyday citizens, um, but also those who have day-to-day -day responsibility for managing uh, the park space. With a process set out for non-standard activities, those non-day-to-day -day things that perhaps need some agreement before they can take place, but nothing is, uh, or very little is ruled out. And then a sensitivity, of course, to the residents who will be living around this park and also to the needs of the embassy. Having the American embassy uh, on the park uh, raises particular security issues that many other parks perhaps wouldn't have. All of this is to be guaranteed through the Section 106 agreement, uh, which has been signed, uh, enacted through a management company on, on which the London Borough of Wandsworth uh, is to be represented. Um, and with the charter publicly visible to all users, both online, but also at uh, key entrances to the park itself. So if you want to uh, uh, read the wording of the charter yourself, you want to hear more uh, about it, then if you go to my blog, uh, then there's a little article that explains more about the charter. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed uh, for that description of uh, POPs and uh, what it means to the park. Uh, uh, now um, we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion, and that will include uh, uh, Councillor Govindia, Jenny Jackson, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Shirley Smith, uh, Professor Carmona, and they're joined by Emily Denrico, who's a development manager, M3 Consulting. And uh, she's a, a, one of the development managers for the park and worked closely with Camlins and Professor Carmona and has been involved in setting the uh, principles and responsibilities for developers and housing providers. And she managed the uh, design and town planning process of the residential plots. And she's been involved, very much involved with the Royal Mail Group, one of the major landowners involved in the opportunity area. So Emily, before we start the general discussion, perhaps you can just tell us a bit more about your role and how developers work together with uh, the planners and, of course, with each other. Yeah, certainly. Thanks very much. Um, so as it's been captured previously, um, M3 are development managers and project managers, and we worked alongside um, Royal Mail supporting them um, after the um, opportunity area um, was identified. Um, and helping them in, in their kind of property strategy as a, as a response to that and bringing forward the planning application for a residential lead mass plan on, on our section of the park that you saw in the kind of jigsaw plan um, at the very beginning of the presentation. We've been working with Royal Mail since that kind of OA, OAPF stage um, and um, I joined the project in, in 2018 and we started looking at the, the landscaping proposals in more detail. In terms of how the landowners and developers have worked together. Um, I think the, the key word is collaboration and it, it's about sharing of information and, and coming together with this kind of I suppose, common interest and um, shared aspiration to make this a successful place. And that was there from the, the very outset of the project and has been there the whole time that, that I've been involved in, in the project as well. Um, and so that ranges from formal meetings where we come together as landowners um, to provide updates on the project, to, to share design information, um, to make sure that we're, we're all heading in the same direction and that our proposals for the park are, are well integrated and um, well informed as well. Um, that can involve um, you know, sharing information on tree species to make sure that we're um, bringing together the same kind of, of planting proposals, as well as going all the way through to sharing our management plans um, so that long term we can make sure that the, the whole park is, is managed in, the, in a cohesive manner. manner. 
Um, I think in terms of our approach with um, with Wandsworth, there's obviously various obligations um, that we've signed up to um, within the planning process. Um, but in terms of our pre-app process and particularly um, in relation to the landscape design, again, it, it came down to a collaborative approach. Um, it felt much more like a, a workshop um, type of meeting so that we could um, make sure that we were um, meeting and exceeding hopefully the aspirations of the council in terms of designing and delivering um, a high quality public realm that was inclusive and accessible to all um, for people that were were living um, within the scheme and then also visitors to the area um, and then also committing to a to a long-term management plan so it's this kind of shared aspiration to make this a successful place which was there at the outset and and has continued through so it's all in our best interest to work together so whether that's having a collaborative workshop as a pre-app or coming together around the table, as Matthew said, to a, agree a, um, a charter, which was a new thing for, for all of us around the table. Um, and um, I think it's been captured perfectly in terms of the, the positive way that we responded, acknowledging the role that this could have and um, the kind of what it could bring to the park in terms of the positive language, allowing people um, to, to do things and, and feel that this was open to everyone. Um, so I think hopefully that that kind of captures the approach, but it's it's mainly about kind of collaboration and communication and the landowners working together. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, now, um, Ravi, perhaps I, I could just ask you a question, because, of course, in the uh, post COVID environment, we're all realizing that green spaces are just so much more important in the city and, of course, access not just for people on the site but also to the south of the site is important for people to be able to get to those green spaces and actually even uh, maybe one day the people in Westminster will be able to cross over a bridge won't they how's that going well Peter you're right to allude to the bridge well we have actually got the plans for the bridge uh, up to a point where we now need to negotiate and engage with Westminster Council and the mayor's office because we can't build a bridge unless both sides of the landing have an agreement to build and deliver the bridge. Good. Well, we, we, we wait uh, for uh, Westminster to respond uh, with interest. Um, uh, so, Jenny, perhaps I, I, I could then ask uh, you a little bit about, um, I mean, the, you have an agreement with the uh, current uh, landowners um, on the park. What happens? when those sites are perhaps in the future sold or uh, uh, all the flats are bought and different organizations are running those uh, buildings, what happens then? Thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, well, the league agreements that I referenced, which are bound to the planning permissions granted, actually the term is bind the successors in title. So if the developers do sell on sites to, uh, to others, then they will be bound by the same terms of those legal agreements under Section 106 of the Act to ensure that we maintain that as publicly accessible space in perpetuity. Jolly good. Glad to hear that. No. Uh, Paul, perhaps I, I could I could ask you then. Um, I mean, how have you integrated uh, local heritage and sort of cultural identity into the spaces that you've been uh, looking at after? Um, well, I think you know, just thinking back, um, a, a lot of it comes from what we think about as the, as the parent landscape. It was a you know before, even before it was industrialised, it was a kind of a marshy kind of area and. Um, a lot of the landscape design that I alluded to before is is having the paths are slightly higher than the landscape around them, which which refers back to sort of vegetated low marshy areas with with boardwalks through. So that's that's quite a theme. Some places it's it's literally uh, come come right through to the to the current design. But um, I mean also we've we've always been aware of things like um, the fact that it's it's quite near the centre of London, but it's actually physically very separated as well. So. The idea of Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens was there because it's close to the middle of London, as it was then, 1780s century London, Georgia London, but um, is is not, um, is you know, but people sort of come away from the, the centre and go back again. So it's that that's a sort of a cultural reference. Um, Thanks, and uh, uh, Matthew, um, you talked about the rights of of, of citizens and. Uh, I guess, though, there must be a particular issue when you're dealing with space outside a, a, a major embassy. Um, I might say, in particular, the U.S. embassy. And you know, the, I, I know that uh, 
the project manager of the embassy, they, in other countries, they're used to having barbed wire and uh, all that sort of thing around their embassies. And so the, the, the sort of having a, a civic space there, it was, it was quite eye opener for them. How, how, how did you, uh, or how will POPs and your charter deal with that aspect of things? Well, I think the you know there obviously does need to be a sensitivity to the fact that uh, the the American embassy is right on the park. Um, there are all sorts of security issues that go along with that, um, and the, you know the American embassy have have you know very tight security procedures around their perimeter and so forth in place. But there's ways and means of doing security which aren't so much sort of in your face as the barbed wire and, and, and the big dogs. <laughs> you know, the, 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 there's things that can be done that, that mean the place is secure, but it feels open, it still feels open, it still feels civic. Um, and, you know, obviously that's been part of the design that wasn't reflected in the charter. But what the charter does is it, it just sort of it, it references the fact that, that uh, you know, there will be occasions where there are particular particular needs of the American embassy may need to take precedence, for example, demonstrations and so forth when they, they might happen. Um, but beyond that, it's, you know, the aspiration is that the whole park will remain public and civic and open to, you know, everybody that wants to use it in the way that we would expect any uh, good public space in our city. So, so no men in yellow coats jumping out from behind trees to stop me cycling? Well, I would hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Good and e Emily. Um, I mean, I've always thought it's it's been a really interesting part of the story of uh, Nine Elms of actually getting developers um, uh, working together on 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 projects like this, and uh, the the sort of thought of uh, well, cats in sacks um, sort of uh, comes to mind when you think of actually trying to get everyone uh, working in the same direction. Can you give us a little the tenor of of how how well your the requirements of the uh, uh, Royal Mail site and the others actually how you actually did uh, come to agreement in those sort of situations or was everyone just perfectly aligned from the word go? I think um, as I mentioned that kind of shared aspiration to to make this. Um, an amazing place kind of was there from the start. Um, in terms of, of making sure um, that it wasn't a hodgepodge of um, kind of developer design landscapes that, that didn't feel like one park, one park, at a very early stage, um, a shared palette um, was agreed. Um, so we knew that there were some, some basic fundamentals um, that had been banked and, and, and agreed upon so that anyone's designs coming forward through the various um, RIBA stages would, would take forward, um, you know, whatever was you were walking on or the, the kind of the lighting styles. Um, so that, as Paul referenced, whilst you might walk through character areas, um, which reflect the architecture of each individual development and the space that's provided within them, there is this um, underlying continuity um, to make it feel like you are um, walking through a um, one park that has been um, well thought through and, and coordinated. Um, on the other side, um, you know, we um, are sharing information regularly. Most recently, we've been having meetings to make sure that we have um, a coherent um, signage strategy. Again, that kind of um, it reflects. Um, each individual um, developer's section of the park, but there is a continuity running through the park and a common approach to, to wayfinding. Um, so I think it was about identifying the issues that um, we needed to address together um, and agree upon, um, whilst allowing each developer um, the, the freedom and the landscape ar architect freedom to, to de design a park that responded to their particular section. So while, while I've, I've got you on, I mean, uh, Dan here asked what collaboration have you um, engaged in with existing local residents uh, so far? And is there a plan for engaging with uh, local residents in, in a meaningful way in the future? Um, so I suppose through the um, design process, um, there was the um, kind of public consultation um, process. And um, certainly we were um, keen to, to talk about our, our landscaping proposal on that. Um, I can't comment on everyone else's um, kind of um, process that they went through um, on their individual consultations, um, but there was certainly an openness to, to working with local, local communities. Um, we also, through the planning process, um, submitted a cultural strategy um, and various plot developers um, have done that as well. 
um, again, they were coordinated and complementary to make sure that um, there was um, different cultural offerings um, in different areas of the park. Um, and again, that was taking into account um, the local um, needs um, in the area and um, having a look at um, existing local cultural organisations that um, could come to the park and, and use some of the space. Going forward, there will also be um, those kind of strategies that are shared between the developers to make sure that whether it's you know, making sure there's not two farmers markets um, on, on at the same time or an event at, at the same time um, and opening up those um, areas that Paul identified um, in his presentation as um, potential performance spaces um, bringing the community um, into those kind of spaces and, and really promoting the fact that this park is, is open to all. Um, and there are opportunities for the local um, community to become engaged. Thanks very much. And uh, uh, Jenny, we had a, had a question about uh, light levels. I mean, is, is, is that an issue in uh, around with developers? I guess uh, that's referencing some of the taller buildings and whether they shade the, the, the spaces. Yes, so that is something that we would look at um, on planning applications for new parks and open spaces to ensure that they receive you know, good levels of, of daylight and sunlight, usually on specific days of the year. There are some technical assessments that we do uh, around that. And obviously one of the benefits of this park, as we described, was the fact it runs east to west and, and it has these green fingers that extend to the other areas of, of um, open space and up to the river. So there's good opportunity around the buildings um, for uh, you know, good levels of daylight and sunlight to be achieved. And I think that also contributes towards Peter's description of these series of outdoor rooms with you know, a different character um, for, for some of them um, and how the planting will contribute to that as well. Thanks. And uh, Paul, perhaps uh, I would ask you, there's a question around climate change and uh, how, how are strategies for dealing with the issues around sort of flooding, uh, rising sea levels, right tree species uh, and all that sort of thing? How, how have you built that into the project? You're muted, Paul. I beg your pardon, schoolboy error. Um, the whole of the park is suds infrastructure. So the whole thing is like a sponge that um, soaks up um, rainfall and then of course uh, re reuse it, the plants will reuse it. Um, underneath the park, there's also substantial um, um, uh, tank, you know, tanks, attenuation tanks as, as well um, for, for all of the surrounding buildings. Um, the the ground actually is, is heavily contaminated below a certain level. So um, everything, the, the park itself and all the growing medium around the buildings and the park is, um, is all um, been completely remediated and it's all, it's all fine to grow things in, but there's a membrane below, it's about two metres down, um, so the trees don't have access to groundwater, so the park is actually irrigated to ensure it will, um, you know, it will thrive, um, and that's just, just the, the, the fact that the ground is, is so badly, uh, um, you know, so badly contaminated below that level. Um, the, the, the planting does, um, it does help a lot with um, you know, being in, in front of, to, to help ameliorate uh, um, uh, solar gain from the buildings and also there's a lot of greenery on top of the buildings which um, uh, mitigate the temperatures within buildings or moderate the temperature within buildings. So um, it, it, it does it in, in many ways basically. But uh, there, I'm, there aren't many uh, green walls, are there, around the buildings? I mean, that's something which has become more fashionable in recent times to increase the urban greening factor. But uh, is that something you encourage? Um, we haven't. No, not, I don't think there are any. Um, there are any actual um, sort of living, living green walls on the architecture. Um, but there's, there's an awful lot of climbing plants, um, which are... Um, you know, less less intense use, but achieve achieve excellent effects as well. Um, but it's it's quite quite traditional, really, in that way. Yeah. Very good, thank you. And uh, Ravi, there's a, a question about who 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 the, the, that school we saw. Who's it for? Well, the school is part of the framework to provide school places for children in the new developments and in the existing communities. And the school that we will be building as a council. Uh, and it's one that is planned through the Our Children's Services Department. Very good, thank you. 
and now Emily, there's a question on timeline. So when, when will the planting happen? Well, obviously there's quite a lot of planting happening already, but when will the park be complete? Um, well, obviously there is this um, section of the park that is already open um, and being um, enjoyed at the moment in front of um, the embassy and embassy gardens. Um, the Royal Mail um, section of the site, um, we're hoping to be um, on site doing landscaping work um, later um, this year in, in the autumn and winter. Um, you, you know, if you drive past or walk past or cycle past the site, you can see buildings coming out of the ground um, within the Royal Mail section of the site. So we will be um, delivering landscaping um, in, in time for, for their completion um, and for, for residents moving in. Um, uh, in terms of the um, Vauxhall end of the park, RNF are, are working through um, some design proposals with um, Wandsworth at the moment, and that will be coming on um, a little bit later. Um, so these are the, the kind of things in terms of um, updating um, programmes at our, our landowner meetings to make sure that we're um, letting each other know when adjoining bits of the park will be coming forward. Um, but broadly, it will be kind of, I suppose, the, the mid, mid 20s um, onwards, um, and we'll see the whole park um, being delivered. Thanks. And uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the, the park is going to be open 24 7, um, and uh, the local landowners are going to be responsible for sort of, sort of managing their bits. What, uh, what, what happens um, when there are, I might say, there are conflicts between um, people having parties in the park? which I presume Matthew would allow them to do uh, at night and residents wanting to get to sleep? Um, well, I suppose that's, that's the objective of the, um, of the charter. And um, one of the key aspects that um, kind of runs through it and is clearly set out um, is the, um, the element of respect. Um, so there is um, a kind of acknowledgement expected in terms of residents who are moving in that um, they're enjoying the park and others will enjoy the park as well. But then any visitors and users of the park, they also need to, to respect the fact that this is um, an urban park that's surrounded by um, residential accommodation, which is where people live and they have a right to enjoy um, you know, their, their flats and a right to enjoy the, the common areas as well. Um, so that's, that's the kind of, um, I suppose, the driver at the moment is that it will be um, based on the, on the charter. Um, and there is, I suppose, a, um, a level of acceptability um, um, in terms of parties and, and that kind of thing um, that will be in line with that. I think if I could just come back on that, Peter. Yes, Matthew, yes. There, there's, uh, within the charter, there's built into it this idea that, you know, if somebody did want to have a party, um that uh, you know th they would put that uh, the idea to uh, the management company and the idea is that the management company needs to, to think positively about any uh, any suggestions but it would then be part of a discussion about you know what's the nature of the party how long can it go on you know what you know noise and so forth um so it, it's I, I suppose it's about balancing the various interests not wanting to say no to people who want to have fun and enjoy the park and, and have a party or whatever but at the same time being aware that there's residents there and we need to be respectful for, 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 for there as well and you know it, it, coming back to so your earlier question about um the implementation of the charter i, I think the, the charter in a sense is just the starting point what then needs to happen is there needs to be perhaps training and a good understanding by um, the, the management company of, uh, around the principles of the charter so that those are then implemented. There's no point in just having a charter as a piece of paper that, that uh, sits there and nobody ever looks at. What you want is citizens to be able to say, right, well, it says in the charter I can do this, so don't stop me from doing that. Um, and so it's really, really very clear to all, both the citizens, uh, the management company, future uh, landowners and so forth what are the key principles that have been signed up to. That's true, but do, do these days people actually ask permission to have parties? Don't they just put out an invitation on WhatsApp and off you go? <laughs> well, maybe that, maybe that is the case, but I think there would be some, you know, they, they, they would, you know we're not suggesting that, that, that there would be no need for any sort of policing of, of, of these sorts of activities. You know, somebody having a big party in, 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 in my street uh, or your street, um, if it was down in the middle of the night during the work, you know, work week, then probably residents would be a bit fed up about it. So we need mechanisms to deal with those sort of situations. 
Very good. Okay, well, we're still on um, the, the idea of sharing space, and this is one for Jenny. I mean, how, how will that work uh, for uh, when you've got cyclists and pedestrians in the same spaces? Thank you, uh, Peter, for that one. Um, that is something that we are doing some work on. I think clear signage and, and design that encourages particular types of, of uses. There are spaces intended for leisure cycling at, and the cycling strategy for the area does envisage different types of routes for different types of, of cycling. Uh, I mean, pedestrians could be or can be protected by providing infrastructure away from shared spaces for commuter cyclists and more advanced cyclists. Um, so that way, I think we can encourage more of the uh, leisure cyclists, if I can call them that, into shared spaces. So, it, it, you know, those shared spaces aren't dominated by um, fast traveling cyclists or certainly faster than I would travel on my bike. Um, and we're also investing in TFL's highway improvement scheme for the Nine Elms Lane, Battersea Park Road Junction. So that will improve facilities for pedestrian cyclists and buses I think the first phase is just completing outside of the power station and then we have an aspiration to deliver a route along the viaduct and Ponton Road that will also provide some safe cycling facilities. Thank you uh, well bring that question together with uh, uh, Emily's comments about respect uh, Matthew I mean uh, respect is, is perhaps a very good answer to how we live in cities um, together um, comfortably anyway, isn't it? How, how, how do we actually engender greater respect uh, both between all road users, probably most importantly, but also uh, all the various uh, users of public spaces in the city? Well, I suppose most of the time it just happens quite naturally, doesn't it, that we most of us are fairly respectful of, of each other within the city and that's the way we sort of get along together. And, and what you hope is that, that um, uh, a, a new park or a new public space that those same ways of you know citizens working will will happen um, quite naturally um, the charter is just there to ensure that uh, that is the situation because you know occasionally when we have new public spaces there are rules and regulations put in place that people you know get frustrated about you know why is this stopping me taking a photograph or why is this stopping me uh, you know cycling through this bit of the park and uh, so just Putting it in place uh, very clearly up front means that you know, everybody knows where they are. And hopefully, uh, for the few occasions where we don't get on together as citizens, then it'll, you know, it, 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 it'll be the sort of thing that we can point to. Say, this is, this is the way that we should be behaving. And how does your charter differ from the mayor's? The, the Mayor's Charter is a sort of really a set of principles, um, sort of London-wide principles about the, you know, what are the sort of qualities of, of, of equitable public space, the very sort of high level set of principles. I think what this charter does is it says specifically for Nine Elms, these are the sets of ideas that are going to sort of govern the future management of, of, of this space and it's very positive and very open and and, uh, and um, uh, you know hopefully and, and short as well not complex uh, full of simple language that people can understand um, so I think it, it relates very well to the mayor's charter but it's quite specific for 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 nine elms Great, thank you very much. And finally, we're nearly up to time, but Jenny, so in um, uh, 30 seconds, can you sort of tell me about the council's role in bringing all this together? A fairly unique thing of, of actually uh, bringing lots of developers to create a sort of coherent uh, strategy? Well, I think, first of all, the vision that Councillor Govindia described so well at the beginning. So without the vision, the, the the linear park wouldn't have been part of that opportunity area planning framework so it's been secured through the development planning process as part of the council's local plan and site allocations documents and then as each planning applications come in um, Mark Hunter and Sharon Malloy and the team have negotiated with those developers to ensure that those pieces of park which now fit together like a jigsaw are delivered and they're secured as I described through that legal agreement process so we have them in perpetuity and the benefit obviously is as Emily is and um, others have described today of the developers wanting to work together to add that value to the VNEB area. Very good. Thank you very much. Well, it's uh, uh, 
piecing together bits of the city like that is, is uh, you know, something that even Ab Abercrombie, back in his uh, 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 plan for London in the post-war period, looked at. And of course, there's the Thames Path too, which is a great piece of, I uh, might say, similar approach to, to planning. But to be able to walk from Battersea up to Lambeth in the future is going to be great and enjoy the new spaces within uh, uh, VNEB too. So uh, thank you everyone for coming together today as a part of the uh, London Festival of Architecture to discuss the, I'd say, the changing face of London and the, I uh, might say, e exceptional progress that has been, uh, has taken place just in uh, no, less than 10 years in the area. So uh, thank you all very much.